Well, 3.45, study on Tuesday afternoon. Number 19, 3.45, Tuesday afternoon. Put that long to man up, does it, eh? 19 studies already in three days. No, it's four days. Four days, right. Good, now we'll come back to the uh, life story of Christ again. And we're concerned now with the... Um, with the steps he took to, to maintain and develop and preserve his holy life. Holiness, of course, being a life of obedience and a life of faith. I must say the children are being very, very nice to behave, aren't they? So quiet you wouldn't even know they're here. Very, very good. Yes, that's where the praise must go, of course, and to the parents as well who cooperate with the Lord in this work. Now... I'd like to turn um, to page 89, across to page 90 again in the book Desire of Ages. Um, it's very interesting, of course, that uh, at the very time the Lord has given a special light on, on bringing up our children and saving our children, that we're looking at the life of Jesus Christ as a child to gain a beautiful picture of what our, the child life can be of those who um, are best led to the Saviour. Now I read from page 8, 9 to 19. From the time when the parents of Jesus found him in the temple, his course of action was a mystery to them. He would not enter into controversy, yet his example was a constant lesson. He seemed as one who was set apart. His hours of happiness were found when alone with nature and with God. Whenever it was his privilege, he turned aside from the scene of his labor to go into the fields, to meditate in the green valleys, to hold communion with God on the mountainside or amid the trees of the forest. The early morning often found him in some secluded place, meditating, searching the scriptures or in prayer. From these quiet hours he would return to his home to take up his duties again <coughs> and to give an example of patient toil. One thing which powerfully impresses me is the fact that um, a significant factor in Christ's success from babyhood to manhood and the final crucifix was the fact that he spent time in prayer with God every day and very often late into the night and what impresses me too is the fact that Christ didn't merely go out and say his prayers didn't rattle off a, a set series of words and phrases Christ knew how to talk with God how to give God his problems how to reach out to the open door how to lay hold upon the life and power of God until that life from God literally flowed into him and the life of God became his life. And I already learnt a lot about that from the wonderful statements in the book Ministry of Healing, some of which I'll now take time to read, where um, we're told that um, the life of God literally flows into the body of the believer and we learn to pray as God planned we should pray. And I, I am learning... The, the power in that prayer that kind of prayer because um, without that kind of communion I certainly could not maintain the rather rigorous program which is my program this year in particular now on page 17 I read these words Ministry of Healing Our Lord Jesus Christ came to this world as the unwearied servant of man's necessity He took our infirmities and bore, and bore our sicknesses he might minister to every need of humanity the burden of disease and wretchedness and sin he came to remove it was his mission to bring to men complete restoration he came to give them health and peace and perfection of character varied were the circumstances and needs of those who besought his aid and none who came to him went away unhelped now listen from him flowed a stream of healing power and in body and mind and soul men were made whole in Testimonies volume 5 page 443 we're told that there are many ways of practicing the healing art but there's only one way which heaven approves only one way and very obviously of course Christ was the model medical missionary and he practiced that one way and in that one way there is a, a flowing of life out of God through Jesus Christ and into the sick body of the sick person and when a stream of life flowed from God into the sick person then obviously what happened the sick person was made whole right now very obviously of course the, um, the finest 
preventative for disease is to receive an inflow of that life every single morning and again every single night and in the midday too or several times a day if every chance we can get to draw aside we can draw down more of that life into ourselves so we become vitalized and obviously when you have a person into whom the life of God flows every day and that person becomes filled and charged with that heavenly current then that person is receiving a new endowment of health every day so what chance has disease got to advance in that person's body? None. None whatsoever. Now turn to page 115 for further thoughts along these lines and um, I now read from this particular page when the gospel is received in its purity and power when the gospel now what is the gospel? the power of God which is the life of God which is the love of God which is redeeming power remember I read to you from from Acts the Apostles page uh, 551 about the love of God being this redeeming power So, so the gospel is the power of God the love of God is the power of God so therefore the gospel is the love of God so all these things are synonymous the love of God, the power of God, the health of God the life of God and the gospel they're all the same thing now when that gospel is received in its purity now what does the word purity mean here? a pure gospel, what is that? obviously pardon? Holy. Holy. yes it's a holy gospel but it's also the gospel not, not some diluted not a form of it not, not some gospel which is half error half truth but it is the gospel in its purity and its power now when it is received it is a cure for the maladies which, origi- which, which originated in sin the sun of righteousness arises with healing in his wings Malachi 4 verse 2 not all that this world bestows can heal a broken heart or impart peace of mind or remove care or banish disease fame, genius, talent all are powerless to gladden the sorrowful heart or to to restore the the wasted life and note this next sentence the life of God in the soul is man's only hope so what's our only hope? the life of God where? in the soul the The next sentence says the love which Christ diffuses to the whole being is a vitalizing power every vital part the brain, the heart, the nerves it touches with healing by it the highest energies of the being are roused to activity it frees the soul from the, from the guilt and sorrow the anxiety and care that crush the life forces with it comes serenity and composure it implants in the soul joy that nothing earthly can destroy joy in the Holy Spirit health giving, life giving joy our Saviour's words come unto me and I will give you rest are a prescription for the healing of physical, mental and spiritual ills. Though men have brought suffering upon themselves by their own wrongdoing, he regards them with pity. In, them they, in him they might find help. He will do great things for those who trust in him. Now every day, Jesus Christ, even if there's a child, drew aside not just to pray but to hold communion with God, not just to tell God his troubles not just to give God his problems but to actually reach out and lay hold upon that stream of life which flowed out of the Almighty into him so that every day he received a fresh endowment of the actual life and power of God and we cannot underestimate nor dismiss the power of nor, nor, nor dismiss the importance of this vital element in Christian living and only those who learn the true science of prayer are going to make a life a a success of their life work only those who learn to pray as Jesus prayed only those who learn to reach out and lay hold upon that stream of life from God and draw them into themselves and thereby feast upon the leaves of the tree of life only they are going to make a success of their life work and develop into strong, active, vital and successful Philadelphians And Sister White says that if we make our life a success we must understand the true science of prayer. And dominant in in the life story of Jesus was this was his maintaining that living connection with God whereby his experience could be blessed right along. Now let's move a little further in this in this chapter. Um 
He goes to talk now about um, the relationship he had to his mother, which was, of course, one of very, very profound love and respect. I want to... Um, well, there is a statement here I want to read too, where it talks about the fact that um, while no one could say a miracle had been performed, yet um, it was evident that life had flowed out of him into the people people who were near to him. Uh, I think it might be on... Uh, Yes, on page 92. And this gives us some idea of the power already present in the life of the youth and the young man as a result of this continual communion with his heavenly father and by his walking out a life of perfect holiness or obedience. Jesus was the healer of the body as well as of the soul. He was interested in every phase of suffering which came under his notice and to every sufferer he brought relief, his kind words having a soothing balm. None could say that he worked a miracle, but virtue, the healing power of love, went out from him to the sick and distressed. Thus, in an unobtrusive way, he worked for the people from his very childhood. And this was why, after his public ministry began, so many heard him gladly. Yet, through childhood, youth and manhood, Jesus walked alone. In his purity and faithfulness, he trod the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with him. He carried the awful weight of responsibility for the salvation of men. He knew that unless there was a decided change in the principles and purpose of the human race, all would be lost. This was the burden of his soul, and none could appreciate the weight that rested upon him. Filled with intense purpose, he carried out the design of his life that he himself should be the light of men. We turn now to the life story of John the Baptist. And uh, I introduce this at this point because... John the Baptist is a direct type of the people through whom the final work shall be accomplished. I, want, I don't want to take the entire story, just the, the aspects dealing with um, the holiness in John's experience and the sort of tremendous value of building into a person the spirit of obedience, the spirit of submission and therefore the spirit of holiness. Um, the statement I'm looking for now is um, on page 101, page 101. As a prophet, and this is the second paragraph, Desire of Ages, page 101. As a prophet, John was to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And now note this next sentence very carefully. In preparing the way for Christ's first advent, he was a representative of those who are, who are to prepare a people for our Lord's second coming. So then, John the Baptist is a symbol, a type, or a representative of whom? The Philadelphian church. Is that right? Now, as such, then, is his life story of particular interest to us at this time? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Was John's mission successful? Yes. Preeminently so, even though he himself looked upon as a miserable failure. He thought he'd been a failure in his work, but the Word of God makes it plain that John the Baptist was a very, very successful messenger when he did God's will and did it very successfully and completed the mission he was sent to, sent to accomplish. So therefore, just as Jesus Christ is a witness to us of what we are to be and how we are to be it, so likewise is John the Baptist. And of course the value of John the Baptist's ministry is this. It proves that if the, it proves that the life of Christ can be copied. It proves that the same experience that Christ had can also be found in a person who follows the same principles of preparation as Jesus Christ did. Now as you know of course um, there are very special instructions given to the parents of John the Baptist in regard to his upbringing. And they're well worth your while to read if you'd like to go through the previous several pages in your own leisure time. I don't plan to give a comprehensive study of Desire of Ages during this camp, although we never go to the first chapter. Um, but I'd like to read the paragraph before, before the one I have just read, which says, In childhood and youth, the character is most impressible. The power of self-control should then be acquired. By the fireside and at the family board, influences exerted whose results are as enduring as eternity. 
more than any natural endowment, the habits established in early years decide whether a man will be victorious or vanquished in the battle of life. Youth is the sowing time. It determines the character of the harvest for this life and for the life to come. And when you think about this principle, that more than anything else, the early habits decide whether the person will be victorious or vanquished in the battle of life. You wonder how anyone ever turns to Christ in adulthood, don't you? Really. And when you think of the habit pattern of modern society, of, of modern youth in the modern society, when the young people are growing up with nothing to do but watch television, go to school and make nuisance of themselves, when um, they have every bad habit being developed, you wonder how there could ever be a harvest in the last days. I mean, when you go back a couple of generations, especially back to the American pioneer days, the young people knew what work was. They grew up working very hard and, and they became very disciplined and well-developed people physically, mentally and spiritually. And uh, yet even then, of course, there wasn't too much of a harvest back in those days either. Now, <clears throat> we turn the page now to page 102 and we'll come to this principle of communion and uh, we'll recognize how in the life of John the Baptist there was established through communion a very, very close walk with God even though he was not delivered in those early days entirely from the wrong ideas that were prevalent in regard to the mission of the coming Messiah. And I'm going now to show how the inbuilt character was a, a, a saviour or, or it, it saved him from where his mind might have taken him. Now let's take first of all the mind of John the Baptist that is the intellectual department of, of him his learning in other words the things that he understood now on this side John had a lot of truth but he also had some very serious error well I'll put truth and error I think to, to cover the picture best so there is truth and there is also error now in what field did the errors lie? in regard to the coming kingdom remember? Yes. and I'll read some statements in a little while to demonstrate that now this, this, um, these errors of course were inherited they, they came down to him because of the teaching of the day but the truth of course he gained by the study of the word of God both in the created word and in nature now on the other side John the Baptist had a, a disposition or a, a spiritual nature Let's put the name, we'll put the word heart. I, I, I never liked the word heart too much because it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult to explain, but the word heart, as I'm using it here, defines the spiritual nature of John the Baptist and the spirit in him, which of course was a spirit of obedience or the spirit of self-sacrifice, that was developed by a life of very, very deep communion with God through nature and the word. And this was a true spirit it's called by such a way the spirit of abnegation or the spirit of total submission to the will of God now I want you to see how by, by spending much time in communion with God and developing and thereby having developed in himself the very love and spirit and character of God that held him against the, the attacks that Satan made against him by virtue of the fact that he had these wrong ideas because obviously, of course, of course, Satan took the, the utmost advantage of the situation and Satan did his level best, as we shall learn as we read on, to work through these errors to destroy the faith of John the Baptist and cause him to turn aside from his allegiance to God and thus betray the very work which God seemed to do. Now, this makes it very clear, of course, that it's far more important to have a deep spiritual communion with God than to be in the truth entirely. In other words, if you have certain errors in your mind, that's bad of course, but, but, but it's, not, it's nowhere near so bad as having a weak spiritual connection with God. If we have a strong spiritual connection, that will hold us until this can be corrected. Right? So where must the emphasis be placed then? On walking with God day by day having the divine love in our hearts, having the character of God in us, having that spirit of submission to God's commands, and then the erroneous ideas will be removed one by one in their due time. Yeah. Pardon? Did you repeat that? I've forgotten it. 
<laughs> Messina. What I was saying was it's um, it's very important that day by day we establish a, a, a connection with God and develop the spirit of submission to His will. And, and if we maintain that, then that will take care of these errors which God will deliver us from one by one. So let's read there on page 102 and 3 the kind of training that John experienced in the desert and um, then, we'll, then we'll go further on to the, to, to the story of his imprisonment and final death to demonstrate how the experiences gained or the character gained through this communion with God was his salvation later. Page 102 But the life of John was not spent in idleness, in ascetic gloom or in selfish isolation. From time to time he, he went forth to mingle with men and he was ever an interested observer of what was passing in the world. From his quiet retreat he watched the unfolding of events with vision illuminated by the Divine Spirit. He studied the character of men that he might understand how to reach their hearts with the message of heaven. The burden of his mission was upon him. In solitude, by meditation and prayer, he sought to gird up his soul for the life work before him. Although in the wilderness he was not exempt from temptation, so far as possible he closed every avenue by which Satan could enter, he was still assailed by the tempter. But his spiritual perceptions were clear. He had developed strength and decision of character, and through the aid of the Holy Spirit he was able to detect Satan's approaches and to resist his power. John found in the wilderness his school and his sanctuary. Now you'll notice now that first of all, Sister White describes the the book of nature that John read with great clarity and which John saw as a as a symbol or an object list of the great gospel principles and then we turn to his study of the prophetic scriptures and then finally to the results achieved because of this communion with God I read further now like Moses amid the mountains of Midian he was shut in by God's presence and surrounded by the evidences of his power it was not his lot to dwell as did Israel's great leader among the solemn, amid the solemn majesty of the mountain solitudes, but before him were the heights of Moab, beyond Jordan, speaking of him who had set fast the mountains and girded them with strength. The gloomy and terrible aspect of nature in his wilderness home vividly pictured the condition of Israel. The fruitful vineyard of the Lord had become a desolate waste, but above the desert the heavens bent bright and beautiful. The clouds that gathered, dark with tempest, were asked by the rainbow of promise. So above Israel's degradation shone the promised glory of the Messiah's reign. The clouds of wrath were spanned by the rainbow of his covenant mercy. Alone in the silent night he read God's, God's promise to Abraham of a seed numberless as the stars. The light of dawn, gilding the mountains of Moab, told of him who should be as the light of the morning when the sun rises, even a morning without clouds. And in the brightness of noontide he saw the splendour of his manifestation when the glory of the Lord should be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. And that is a description of John the Baptist's reading the mighty power and character of God to the book of nature. Out there in that desert area, and naturally of course we would expect the, we expected a desert area would speak much less about God and more about sin than um, a fertile productive area. You think perhaps that um, if John the Baptist had been sent to a very lush and um, verdant part of the world, he might there have been able to see something of the, see better the greatness of God's character. But John read in that desert a picture of what was, and in the might and splendour of the open heavens above, the sun rising in strength day by day, the great mountain fortresses, he read a picture of what God could do and would do to bring light and glory to that darkened land of Israel. Now we turn to the story of, um, or the description of John's study of the prophetic rolls, or scrolls I should call them, page 103. With awed yet exultant spirit he searched in the prophetic scrolls the revelation of the Messiah's coming, the promised seed that should bruise the serpent's head. Shiloh, the peace giver, who was to appear before a king should, could, should cease to reign on David's throne. Now the time had come, a Roman ruler sat in the palace upon Mount Zion by the sure word of the Lord already the Christ was born. 
Isaiah's rap portrayals of Messiah's glory were he studied by day and by night. The branch from the root of Jesse, a king to reign in righteousness, judging with equity for the meek of the earth, a covered from the tempest, the shadow of a great rock in a weary land, Israel no longer to be turned forsaken, nor her land desolate, but to be called to the Lord my delight, and her land Beulah. The heart of a lonely exile was filled with the glorious vision. Now, <clears throat> that describes now the life of very intense communion that John the Baptist experienced and practiced during those 30 years, or during most of those 30 years, the part that was spent by him, of course, out in that desert region. Now, the next paragraph relates a series of, of causes and effects. The first sentence says, He looked upon the king in his beauty. He, did, he just didn't go out there and pray and just say his prayers. But in those prayers, John the Baptist was given revelations of the character of God. Remember when Moses said to God, Show me thy glory, and God did show him his glory. Now, do we have the right today in our prayer life to plead with God to give to us great revelations of his character and his glory? Yes. Absolutely. And we should be praying that every day. Lord, show me your glory. Open my eyes to see the beauty and the wonder of your character as I read your word or as I bow here in prayer or as I think about your providential works. Open my eyes to see these wonderful things. We should plead with God to give us those revelations because they'll make tremendous... Um, impressions upon our lives for good they will shape and mould our lives into his own divine image because the word of God said by beholding what we become changed <clears throat> so John the Baptist looked upon the king in his beauty and self was forgotten he looked upon the king in his beauty and self was forgotten now we read the other day in respect to the statement from the Bible Commentary Volume 4 1089 that um, mighty angels are sent to answer the prayers of those who are unselfishly working to advance the cause of God. And in the life of Jesus Christ, Desire of Ages, page 208, what was the evidence that self was forgotten in the life of Christ? The statement says, So utterly was Christ emptied of self that... And what follows? He made no plans for himself. So in the, in, in the lives where self is forgotten, what happens to human plan making? It's abolished, isn't it? It has no place there anymore whatsoever. And of course, when we abolish human plan making and human problem solving and give those tasks to God, then we have become obedient and trusting all holy men and women. So when self was forgotten in the life of John the Baptist, then what about his entry into Sabbath rest? He achieved it, didn't he? He beheld the majesty of holiness, right? He beheld the majesty of holiness and felt himself to be inefficient and unworthy. He felt himself to be inefficient and unworthy. Now, human plan making and problem solving, of course, is the mark of a person who thinks himself sufficient and worthy. But if we think ourselves inefficient and unworthy, then how much disposition do we have to make our own plans and solve our own problems none at all or less and less anyway now I want you to notice the connection now of course where it says that uh, he beheld the majesty of holiness and that was the result the next sentence says he was ready to go forth as heaven's messenger and awed by the human and there again is the result of the effect because he had looked upon the divine and there of course is the cause he could stand direct and fearless in the presence of earthly monarchs because he had bowed low before the king of kings. Bowed low, of course, in communion with the God of heaven. Now this makes it very clear that if you want to become forgetful of self, what do you do? You look upon the king and his beauty. Okay? If you want to recognize your inefficiency and unworthiness, then you behold the majesty of holiness. If you want to become ready to go forth as heaven's messenger and awed by the human, then you must look upon the divine. If you wish to stand erect and fearless in the presence of earthly monarchs, then you must bow low before the king of kings. And inasmuch as the Philadelphian people are people who must forget, become totally forgetful of self, who must recognize their inefficiency, inefficiency and unworthiness, 
They must be ready to go forth as heaven's messenger. They must stand erect and fearless in the presence of earthly monarchs. Then, because the Philadelphians must have all those qualities as John the Baptist had them, and at the same time be free from any errors as well, then we must learn to commune with God as Jesus did and as he did. We must learn to look upon the king in his beauty, to behold the majesty of holiness, <clears throat> to look upon the divine and to bow low before the king of kings. And John the Baptist's story, of course, is a very wonderful demonstration of the effect of these spiritual exercises in the life of any person who devotes himself to them. And as you learn the true science of prayer, ask God to teach you how to pray, you'll find that um, while you pray you don't get any grand feeling, you don't get any wonderful rapture, you don't get any wonderful glorious sense of, uh, of, of God being very near to you. Often I pray and get no feeling at all. That doesn't bother me because feeling is not the important thing. We believe because the Word says it, right? That's where our faith rests. It rests in the divine Word of God. But I certainly do see the effects as the days go by and I consistently come back and maintain that prayer life day by day, then I see the effects as, as, as time goes by. And then I'm encouraged, of course, to maintain that prayer life. Now, for instance, um, when I was a student at the Australasian Mystery College, now called Avondale College in Australia, way back beginning in 1944 and 45 and 47, I was inspired by the statement on... I didn't read it today because... Um, although he certainly should have, I guess, back in the, in the chapter in the Passover visit, page 83, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. <clears throat> we should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, and we should be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we will be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Now I knew that statement the way back in 1943. I was challenged mightily by it, and in my youthful days I was inspired to do just, just that, with Desire of Ages being the aid in that, in that hour of thoughtful study every day. And so, I went to college as a poverty-stricken student. I didn't have one brass penny with which to pay fees, and the college very kindly let me work 42 hours per week to pay for my fees and board. Which meant, of course, that I was up um, at 4 o'clock every morning to go work in the college dairy. I worked there until about 7. We then have a, a hasty breakfast between 7 and 7.30, I go to class from 8 o'clock until midday, or until, 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 until 12.30. Then we have lunch and have a short break till about 2 o'clock, and then back to work again, and uh, home for supper, and a little bit of study after that, and then to bed, of course, by about 8 or half past. Now, <clears throat> that meant, of course, to spend the thoughtful hour in contemplation of the life of Christ, meant I had to go to 3 o'clock in the morning, summer and winter, go down to the boys' bathroom, the only place where there was lights, and quietly sit and read this book paragraph by paragraph. I made no attempt to cover a certain area in a, in a given day. I'd read until something caught my attention. I'd sit there and think about it and pray about it and spend from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock when the other boys came down and we all went off to milk the cows together. Now, I, I went through the book seven times in that, in that way <clears throat> over the three years I was there at the school and I was very faithful as a member now in, in getting up every morning to do this. My, my old desire of age, which I have back in Australia, is, is now about 40 years of age, and it's the same kind of leather bonnie as I have in this one. It's still holding together, but mine is a well-worn book. And I say it's the, it's the most used book in my entire library. Now, I must say that at that time, I did not feel any great benefit or blessing. I did it every day. I enjoyed doing it, and I was faithful to it. I didn't seem to fuss about... Uh, um, any marked evidences that God was blessing me in that reading, but, but most certainly the reading of this book, day after day, as I did it back in those days, had a very, very profound moulding effect upon my life because when the message came from Wagon and Jones, I took it gladly and quickly, and I had no trouble taking it, and today, <clears throat> as far as I know, and well, I know, I know it's right too, 
it, is, it is a fact that I'm the only person who was in that school at that time and I was the only person who did that too I know that to be a fact especially on the boy side um, and I'm the only person today who understands that God doesn't destroy and the only person in this message and I attribute I definitely attribute my being where I am today to a large extent to my spending one hour per day more or less in the study of the life of Christ over that period of time and I stress the point that when you spend time in communion with God day by day you're not going to necessarily have any wonderful feelings or any evidence at that point of time that you're being blessed but it's later sometimes much much later that you become aware of the blessing which you have received and the moulding shaping influences there by beholding you are becoming changed but the change is so gradual so quiet it's like the gradual changes your children grow up you don't notice from day to day the changes in them but when someone who hasn't seen them for a year come back they say my hasn't that child grown and you say really you, you can't see because you're there every, every day and don't notice the slight changes from day to day now we want now to go across to the chapter called the imprisonment and death of John the Baptist because I'm very interested to study now the um, the um, how John this is page 214 I want now to study how how that early communion on the part of John stood him in such tremendous stead when he came under great pressure in the, in the dungeon and um, during the fears and troubles that, that beset him during that period of time right we now turn to page 214 and the first paragraph tells how King Herod took John the Baptist and uh, placed him in the prison cell the first sentence says John the Baptist had been first in heralding Christ's kingdom and he was first also in suffering from the free air of the wilderness and the vast throngs that had hung upon his words he was now shut in by the walls of a dungeon cell he became a prisoner in the fortress of Herod Antipas in the territory east of Jordan which was under the dominion of Antipas much of John, John's ministry had been spent it was out there of course that he was placed in prison not the same prison that Peter was placed in later but one out in the desolate areas to the east of the Jordan whereas Jerusalem of course is west of the Jordan now passing on to the next paragraph it says the life of John had been one of active labour and the gloom and inaction of his prison life weighed heavily upon him as week after week passed bringing no change despondency and doubt crept over him his disciples did not forsake him they were allowed access to the prison and they brought him tidings of the works of Jesus and told how the pe people were flocking to him but they questioned why if this new, new teacher was the Messiah he did nothing to affect John's release how could he permit his faithful herald to be deprived of liberty and perhaps of life that was the question which those disciples raised to John the Baptist now those men when they raised that question to John the Baptist we find now that, that they became agents of Satan so let's now put uh, here when um, Satan now would use um, these men let's put John's disciples and here is Satan who now worked through these men to bring doubt and discouragement to the mind of John the Baptist and it was a tremendous pressure brought to him at this, at this period of time and of course the setting was also very important there was the, the prison setting and the, or the environment in which John was placed and after quite a number of weeks of this John was, was very depressed very despondent and therefore Satan supposed in just the state of mind to succumb to his temptations I'll read the next paragraph before I make any further comment to show how the um, these disciples were actually the enemies of John the Baptist when they thought that they were in fact his friends 215 Desire of Ages reads as follows these questions were not without effect doubts which otherwise would never have, been, would never have arisen were suggested to John Satan rejoiced to hear the words of these disciples and to see how they bruised the soul of the Lord's messenger oh how often those who think themselves the friends of a good man and who are eager to show their fidelity to him prove to be his most dangerous enemies how often instead of strengthening his faith their words depress and dishearten 
Now those men said to, said to John the Baptist, now look, with great faithfulness and to, with, with, a, with a great spirit of self-sacrifice, you literally have devoted your entire life to preparing the way for this Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, in return, what is he doing for you? you you've done all that for him, what do you get back? And apparently, what did, they, what did John the Baptist get back? Worse than nothing. Worse than nothing, because by way of reward, he was being left to perish in a miserable dungeon cell. And there was no prison reform back in those days, and those cells were, of course, anything but hygienic, anything but clean, anything but pleasant, and um, they didn't care whether the prisoner shivered to death in the cold nights of winter, whether he had enough food to eat, whether his, his cell could be cleaned or not, whether there were rats down there or whatever it might happen to be. It was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was an unbelievably miserable place to be. Now, that wouldn't have been so bad if John had lived in a slum all his life, but where he'd been all, his, all the days of his life, out in the open air, enjoying the unlimited expanse of nature, free to go where he wished, and now by contrast is in this miserable, cold, dark dungeon cell. And after weeks and weeks and weeks of this, his spirit was very, very miserably broken down, or badly broken down. Now these disciples came and said, now look, if he's the Messiah, then what kind of a character has he got if he leaves you to perish alone in this dungeon cell? Now it would have been better if John the Baptist decided not to come to see him at all, very obviously, because they're a menace to him. And therefore, how careful we have to be when a brother or a sister is in a period of trial not to come manifesting a false sympathy, right? A false sympathy, a misdirected sympathy, which means we have to have a very, very clear understanding of the principle of self-sacrificing love so we can uphold that person in his plight, encourage him to stand firm and true, and enable that person to recognize that he's but a sufferer in the cause of God. Now, what should they have said to him? They should, say, they should have said, John, we've come here to support you in your hour of trial. We know that you're suffering a great deal, but we want to encourage you to understand that this suffering which you're going through is only the natural outworking of your ministry and your work. And Jesus Christ himself shall suffer even worse for you before the battle is over. Now, it is true that God is well able to deliver you from this prison, but if he doesn't do it, it is because he has for you something far better than, than that which you gain by being delivered. Now, I think I mentioned the other day in this camp, was it down in, in, in California? I think it was here, that, um, or maybe it was over in Walla Walla, I've just forgotten now, but if, if I say it again, don't mind, would you please? Um, now, if, if God had delivered John the Baptist from prison and uh, he'd lived out the full span of his natural life and gone to his grave, then today he'd be laying in that grave waiting for the coming resurrection of Jesus Christ. That would have been a great gift of love on God's part. But by leaving him there to die in that prison cell, he gave John the Baptist the privilege of being a witness for the thousands upon thousands of martyrs who would die later, and he also gave John the Baptist the love gift of an early resurrection so John didn't waste 2,000 years in the grave, but right now he's up in heaven. So then... Which was the greater manifestation of God's love to John the Baptist? Pardon? That's right, let him die. It was a greater gift than to rescue him at that particular point of time. Now, if those disciples, by faith, had grasped the, the principles of God's working, they could have been an encouragement to John the Baptist instead of being a discouragement to him. Now, John the Baptist survived this because of that... Uh, that, that, that communion which he held with God and we'll go into that point of course when, when we come back for our next study period very shortly the bell is gone so I have to stop now, any questions you'd like to ask or observations you'd like to make on this study of the life of Christ yes okay the tree of life was taken away from us alright but in its place we were given Christ's life mm -hmm. and I could relate when you were talking Instead of having that tree perpetuate our life, we have the life who gives all life, which is Christ, when we take that healing and that nourishment. Sure, right. And that'll wash away all sickness and, and disease and, and such trouble, but it doesn't give us eternal physical life no. because this physical body belongs to the broken law and the right, broken law is going to heaven. But we have that spiritual right. life and that healing life. Sure, and, and added vitality. 
So we're given enough strength to do whatever God calls upon us to do. It, it provided we lay hold upon that life to do do that work. It's interesting too that Satan, when he was working through those disciples, that they were able.